Welcome everyone to today's webinar, How to Recapture Lost Revenue with Improved Documentation Practices. I am Molly Gamble with Becker's Hostel Review. We'll begin today's webinar with a presentation and we'll have time at the end of the hour for a question and answer session. You can submit any questions you have throughout the webinar by typing them into the Q&A box you see on your screen. We look forward to hearing your questions. We'll also have a series of audience polling questions during today's webinar. When we reach each poll slide, the poll question will pop up automatically on your screen. Our speakers will give a few seconds for you to select an answer from the options on your screen, and then you'll click Submit. Thank you in advance for your participation. Today's session is being recorded and will be available after the event. You can use the same link you used to log into the webinar today to access that recording. At this time, it's now my pleasure to start the webinar by introducing our presenters. Dr. Lucian Newman is a practicing general surgeon in Gadsden, Alabama, with more than 25 years of experience. He has been on the Physician Advisory Board of Blue Cross Blue Shield of Alabama for 15 years and currently serves as chair. At Nuance Healthcare, he serves as CMIO and specializes in CAPD solutions and protecting physician practices by helping them document more completely at the point of care. Dr. Eric Van Lewis is a board-certified hand and upper extremity surgeon a medical administrator at the North Mississippi Ambulatory Surgery Center. With over 16 years of experience at multiple healthcare systems, Dr. Lewis brings a unique and comprehensive background to his specialty. He is also a fellow of the American Academy of Orthopedic Surgeons and led the adoption of an enterprise document management system for the North Mississippi Ambulatory Surgical Center. Finally, I'd like to introduce Michael Damage. Mr. Damage's focus over the past decade has been on understanding existing workflows of physicians and assisting them in the improvement and insisting the improvement of the nuanced surgical CAPD solution. He has worked closely with Dr. Lucian Newman, founder of Vincari, now known as Nuanced Surgical CAPD, and spent many years helping to advance the solution. In his current role as an account executive for the community healthcare market at Nuance, Mr. Damrich helps facilitate the decision-making process for hospitals and ASCs while ensuring they make the best choice for their organization. At this time, I am pleased to turn the floor over to Dr. Newman to begin today's presentation. Thanks, Molly. It's a, it's a pleasure to be with you today. Uh, today, our agenda includes some documentation practices and ASCs that result in inaccurate reimbursement and a, kind of a success story that we have with Dr. Van Lewis, followed by a live demo and Q&A. So we're gonna jump right into a poll question. Um, how effective do you believe that accurate op operative notes are uh, in influencing quality scores and reimbursement? So uh, we've, we've given you four choices. Um, take a moment and chime in. We'll ring those up and see where we are currently. So apparently the audience agrees that uh, it is very effective, and I, I would have to agree with you. Um, I'm going to share with you some personal experience of kind of the journey that got us to this point. Um, so we'll look at uh, the next here, uh, a traditional op note. Uh, unfortunately, this is mine, um, and this is at one of my hospitals. I work at two hospitals and a freestanding ASC. And so the tradition is either by dictating to a telephone or dictating uh, to a dictaphone or voice to text, we were asked to create information. The reality is, is that surgeons are not trained um, how to do op notes. It's kind of a, a skill that we acquire by doing it. And so what you see before you is unstructured freeform dictation that's missing some elements. And of course, the answer to fixing this problem is reminders on the wall or by the phone. And so all of us have been there and seen that. And, and so what, what exactly, where does that lead us? And so what you see before you here is a public scorecard. This is uh, real. Um, and uh, this was part of a 25 page PDF. And at the far right of this slide, it shows you that apparently these surgeons are the worst surgeons in California. Well, it, it's based on expected and observed mortality rates. There's certainly a lot that goes into this. And so the, the reality is, is that the, the product of your work, when we're creating 
theoretically masterpieces in the operating room, um, we're, we're, we're not doing the same thing with our documentation. And so the downstream insurance company or HIM department or quality assessment doesn't always reflect um, how we look. Let's look at a real simple operation, the excision of a pilonidal cyst. You know, doctors, including me, have been concerned about declining reimbursement for years. Um, and you, you think that your words can't mean so much. And if you look in, these are real cases, real RVU values and real dollar values based on changing one word in an op note. And so if you've dictated uh, excision of a polynidal cyst, which I've done it many, many times, um, and failed to include the word extensive or complicated, you're really not doing the right thing because what we're looking for is not up coding, it's, it's just accurate coding. And so this impacts facilities based on their severity of illness scores and of course your, your bottom line reimbursement. And so not to pay some attention to this, in my opinion, is a mistake. So if you think about it, you know, what we're interested in here is creating a more structured system where we have an opportunity to compete and so over the last 20, 25 years, most of the focus on coding in medicine has be, been with the E&M system, the 99 codes. And so there's actually been a, a lot written and taught regarding how we improve that. And unfortunately, the, the system of creating procedural notes has been left, left alone. And so we have uh, imported a rules-based engine that actually gives the doctors an opportunity to compete. And so I like to tell people that, you know, the surgeons most often know the answers to the questions that the coders might have. They very often don't know the question. And so it's really simple and, and most time effective to do that at the point of care. So in order to do that, you have to have a system that's fast, that has memory, and that surgeons will adopt. And we're, I think we're very proud of what this tool has become. So you look look before you that um, we have a major reduction in unbuilt op notes. Um, this this reflects uh, a lot of different financial impacts downstream, and a 15% improvement in, in the RVU weight. I just showed you one example being a polynidal cyst, but if you think about this, this goes across the code book, regardless of your specialty, whether it be cardiovascular, orthopedics, urology, general surgery everybody has much the same uh, impact. Um, obviously, some are dealing with higher RVU cases that have larger impacts, but almost everybody has uh, an impact that when, you, when you're able to choose uh, from a list of your selections here. And so the improvement in APC weight and APC impact, that was based on a retrospective that we did over about 20,000 cases. And so, you know, we currently have about five to 6,000 users across the United States and, and work with literally any other parent EMR system. You know, I like to tell people uh, that uh, we, we are more event-centric. Main primary EMRs are patient-centric, where everything about a given patient might be housed. Uh, what we strive to do is improve the capture uh, of information on every event that happens. So. Dr. Van Lewis is going to share with us some information about what happened at North Mississippi. Dr. Van Lewis. Thanks, Lucian. Uh, and I'm going to be speaking qu quite a bit, uh, primarily as an end user of this, since uh, I use this on a daily basis when I'm in the operating room. Um, as far as looking at the, the benefits of um, this type of system, uh, clearly the, the thing that jumps out uh, and is the, the most easiest to understand is the reduction in the FTEs that are required to, in order to get something done. You immediately em, uh, eliminate the need for the transcriptionist, and that results in a pretty, pretty drastic and, and immediate improvement in your bottom line. Of, for us, it was $40,000. Uh, there are some other um, improvements as well as far as looking at um, how quickly your bills can be processed. Now, um, for me, uh, one of the, the the, the biggest um, improvements and, and benefits is the use of the cell phone. Um, with this system, in the time it takes me to walk from the OR to see my next patient, I've already done an op note. Uh, it's a few clicks and the op note is done. Uh, 
the other benefit of the cell phone is use of the ability to capture pictures. They say that pictures worth a thousand words, and particularly in the complex trauma cases that I'm often involved in, uh, being able to document photographically the degree of injury goes a long way in understanding or having the patient understand what's going on. Also, God forbid, if you're involved in some type of a legal uh, incident later on, having that picture to back up the degree of complexity of the, the injury goes a long way. Uh, it also helps with insurance companies understanding and documenting the things that were done during the operation. Um, Putting the time in up front is going to be the most important thing. Developing the macros uh, is, is going to be the key to making this system work for you. And we had some older physicians and surgeons that were part of this system who kind of grumbled a little bit when we first started uh, implementing this. But once they were taught how to do this, they quickly understood and were able to benefit from the efficiency of it. Right now, only, uh, almost every operation I do, I will make a macro out of it because likely I will come back to something that, if not is exactly the same, will be similar. Um, the other thing is that um, I asked one of my administrators at the surgery center to, to go back and, and tell me what are the really, are the true defined benefits we've seen from this. Not, not so much what the advertisement would say, but what have you really seen once we've implemented this system? And we've been using this now for about three years now. And as I said, the, the first thing that jumped out was the elimination of the transcription costs. Uh, we're also able now to perform queries and corrections uh, electronically rather than dictating, hoping they're done right, and going back and improving them. It eliminates paper and all the inefficiencies associated with that. Uh, it streams line documentation for more rapid and accurate coding and, and the billing, which also improves our revenue cycle. And then it allows customization for providers to uh, promote ease of documentation. And, and again, these are your macros defined exactly by you, so they say what you want them to say. Okay? Um, and I think finally, uh, one of the true testaments of the effectiveness of this is that we initially implemented this at our surgery center, but based on how well it went, our, our parent hospital also adopted the system, and now it's in both facilities. Um, so, uh, overall, I've been extremely pleased with the experience of uh, Nuance, and, and uh, as I said, it, it, on a daily basis, it has significantly improved my efficiency uh, and also my effectiveness. So we can go on to the polling question now. I'll pass that back to you, uh, Lucian. Sounds great. Um, Thank you, Dr. Van Lewis, for your comments. And, uh, you know, you touched on several things that are important here, although I'll tell you that this is a system that's built with um, a lot of advantages for any type of surgeon, including, you know, when you have to recertify, this is keeping track of everything you do and actually produces the exact PDF that the American College requires for recertification. So, you know, there's, there's so many different things that open up when you're using a tool where everything you're doing can be analyzed, including how many cases you've done, how many you did last month, what types of cases, what's your RVU capture. So, you know, this, this really kind of gets past um, some of the boundaries that we placed on ourselves years ago. So uh, the next poll question, if you'll answer, how do you currently document your operative notes, um, transcription, structured workflow, speech recognition in the EHR or other? Um, I'll give you a few seconds here to answer. Um, you know, one of the things is, and I work at uh, two different hospitals and a surgery center, all three of which use this tool. Um, it actually uh, can be used in a, a, a single specialty center or it can be used in a trauma center. And so we, we don't have, you know, boundaries placed on us by the software. Uh, literally any uh, EMR that you work with, we can work with. Um, and, and actually it feeds the information back into the parent EMR. So it looks like that we have uh, kind of a balance here, 30% of transcription and then some structured workflow at 32 and a half, and then speech recognition. And so that, that probably mirrors the population uh, that we see. Um, certainly areas, obviously leverage uh, templated uh, notes. I will say that 
the current templated notes that we see in other systems, um, they, they tend to be rather static. And I think as Michael will show you, in this system, you have the capability of saving not one, but 10, 10 different versions. Myself, um, as a general surgeon, I, I probably have 10 to 12 different versions of a laparoscopic gallbladder operation, whether that patient be uh, obese or whether they have had prior operations with adhesions. Because what I'm looking for is improvement in workflow and improvement in accurate, complete documentation. I, I really think that we should trade uh, some of the repetitive work that we do uh, for an emphasis on quality and information. As I said, I, like Dr. Lewis, use the photo capture on a daily basis. Uh, I, I, I take pictures of wounds that you debris. I take uh, pictures of intraoperative photographs. I also include things such as path reports or CAT scans on, on difficult cases. So if I wanted to refer back to that case, it's really just a keystroke on my phone no matter where I am. If I'm not in the hospital, I can do it at home. If I'm on call, I can see patients that are done in the hospital instantly uh, via the mobile. So Michael, I think I'm gonna turn it over to you and uh, if you have any questions, just please submit them and we'll be talking going forward. Perfect, thank you, Dr. Newman. Yeah, so as we jump into a demonstration of Nuance Surgical CAPD, um, I wanna kind of level set and set the stage um, to, to do so. So as Dr. Newman and Dr. Lewis have mentioned, um, this is an application that is accessible either on a mobile device, whether iOS or Android, or from a, a desktop in the recovery room um, or, or in your office or, or wherever. It's a web-based application, so your user profile um, that also will have a Dragon voice-to-text user profile associated with it so that anywhere in the application where you do want to use voice, um, you're able to do so directly into those fields. And then lastly, there is a piece of functionality for you to be able to dictate um, via, uh, you know, transcription and that, that document is transcribed and sent back in. This is used mainly for the, um, the adoption process and really weaning, if you will, physicians or surgeons off of that old transcription process into this um, application. Because what we see, and is what Dr. Lewis mentioned, you know, there's, there's always some physicians up front who say, I've always done it this way. And so we say, well, let's, let's, let's put the desk uh, telephone down and allow you to dictate through your mobile device, which they appreciate. Then as they continue to dictate, the application is learning from what they have documented, what they've said. And so we're able to then revisit with that physician and show them that by um, by building the report from what it's learned from your previous documentation, the light bulb typically goes off and the aha moment is had where the physician now can see that I'm not going to regurgitate the same dictation, but I will focus on the, uh, the specificity that's in questions that are being asked, which is, I saw a question come through, is the main difference in this and an EHR template that exists, that the rules around the specificity that's required for a certain procedure, whether it's a polynidal cyst, asking you simple, complex, or extensive, or in the example I'm about to walk through in inguinal and hernia, asking if it was recurrent or not, or whether you're a hand surgeon and it's asking you, you know, the extent of, of a certain injury. So no matter what procedure gets asked, we as a, uh, as a team uh, are maintaining and updating all of the questions on a quarterly basis that get asked. What this means is that we're taking the weight off of the HIM or the medical record team at your facility to chase down providers to ask for specificity or to put sticky notes in the dictation lounge. Nuance Surgical CAPD is going to um, ask those questions and again, be updated on a quarterly basis when these rules change, which static templates within an EMR um, are oftentimes go, if you will, out of date in terms of what those specificity questions are uh, when CMS decides to, to add something new. So as mentioned, for the mobile device, um, the first thing is, is like Dr. Newman mentioned, your schedule is going to be pulled from where whatever facilities have access to Nuance Surgical CAPD. So in Dr. Newman's case, considering both hospitals in town and the surgery center um, have access to the application, 
when he wakes up in the morning and pulls up Nuance Surgical CAPD, he has a list of his schedule um, across all the different facilities. That's being pulled from just the scheduling uh, feed from the facility, so it's very simple, populated in that instance. Um, as I mentioned, you also have the ability to document through the desktop um, or what we're looking at on the right side or the desktop view. You can see it's the same exact schedule, whether I, no matter from where I access it, you can see on both of these, I've completed one case today and I've got three more, um, three more to go. So for example, let's focus over on the mobile device on the left-hand side and select that sample patient three um, second in the list. You'll notice I have the option to begin the report. I can click to dictate on the button and then there's the image in the top right for how I can attach an image uh, to the document as well. So it's, the first thing I do is if I hit begin report after this case, as Dr. Lewis mentioned, as I'm walking down the hall to go speak to the family, I have access to all my common cases that if there's any of those specificity questions that need to be answered, once I make a selection, it will prompt me and in just a couple seconds, I, I know I'm giving all of those um, details that the coders are gonna be looking for to get their job done. But as I mentioned, sometimes it's just getting physicians transitioned or um, switching can be, can be difficult. So we do offer the Nuance Surgical CAPD dictation on the go, which again is really more of an onboarding tool because everything I dictate, every case I dictate, it's going to learn the findings, learn the blood loss, and associate those with the procedures and everything just by default so that when I select begin report next time, I've now got laparoscopic appendectomy for me to choose from and then, again, build that report from there, which we will see. Um, and then again, as I mentioned lastly, I'll, I'll talk about it in the actual presentation or the demo of the image. I can take images, whether it's um, whether it's during the case, whether my circulating nurse has, has a device in the room, there's several different workflows for that, uh, but I can show you how I'll attach that as well. So let's expand the desktop and go ahead and jump into a, a real case. So let's assume I'm a general surgeon. I just came out of an ingle to hernia repair. I've um, stepped into the recovery room and accessed surgical CAPD at that point. I'm gonna go ahead and select begin report from my sample patient three here, and it's gonna launch me into the operative builder. Again, you can see that every field in here has the red, yellow, or a green motif. Again, what is required and what specificity are we looking for? So as I mentioned, I'm gonna select my laparoscopic inguinal hernia repair, which is gonna go ahead and populate the majority of your notes similar to the way your EMR template would. The difference in where the value from this application comes are these yellow triangles that have now been populated next to a, a few of these fields. And that is what an EMR template does not have the ability to do. And that's to say, okay, ingle to hernia repair, not specific enough, let's select it. Okay, yeah, this was unilateral without obstruction or gangrene, uh, was recurrent on the left side. And by answering those three questions, you have now given all specificity required. And it's again important to mention that across all diagnoses and all procedures that are performed, it is nuanced um, and our CDI teams that are maintaining this uh, content. So post-op diagnosis, we'll say it was the same. I'll move on to my procedure performed and select the specificity. So here I've already selected it was left, it was recurrent, but there's one more question around extraperitoneal approach. I'll say it was not utilized and we did use mesh. So again, very simple, answer those questions. My blood loss, I'll say it was less than 10 and then I did do an indirect angle to hernia. Notice here some findings have been Remembered, this is an example of how if you dictate or anything you document into these fields, the application is gonna learn and as a snowball, if you will, grow with you over time. Um, and as I also mentioned, Dragon Medical One, if you look in the very bottom left, my Dragon Bar um, is available so that I could literally click in the search bar here, say indirect angle to hernia, and it would then add that um, using Dragon Medical One as well. At this point, this note is done. I'll scroll all the way down. Notice if I wanted to adjust my technique, I could. I have the ability to save, as Lucian, Dr. Newman mentioned, five, ten different versions of these techniques. You can insert variables and things so that if, say, your sutures are different or you do a different closing or whatever it may be, um, you can just change one little piece. But again, let me come over here to charge capture and show you that as a byproduct of just doing the documentation, the way that, again, you would maybe in an EHR template, 
Here, it's going to populate and generate the ICD-10 and CPT codes based on the selections that were made. So not only by filling out the same workflow that you may think you're doing in any application, I'm really doing several things. I'm completing the final op note. I'm completing that immediate post op note that may be necessary if you're doing a transcription workflow today. And then I'm also able to send back a suggested charge capture report back to my office so that uh, literally before I'm speaking to the family, my office can have access to um, those codes as well. And notice for this example, laparoscopic inguinal hernia repair recurrent is an 8.3 RVU. Whereas if you did, you, you left out the word recurrent, it has about a two RVU difference. And again, it's not that it's missed every single time, but these things get missed and they fall through the cracks and those stats that you saw on that last page that Dr. Newman was sharing um, shows that by being proactive and gathering this information on the front end has a dramatic um, improvement to, um, to revenue for the facility. So with that, um, if you see here, my last little piece, where is my images? If I select add image, here are the, all the images that I had maybe taken from my device. We do have the ability to electronically pull devices from, um, from some, some different scopes like Olympus and Stryker to automatically populate those um, as well. But again, at this point, I'm automatically e-signed the document and it's, it's e-signed and sent into whether you've got HST or SIS or whichever EHR or if you're still a paper facility, it can be faxed into the recovery room and stuck onto, uh, on the chart that way as well. So it's, it's really dynamic on the, on the way that it works in terms of delivering information back into the EHR, but it's all about capturing the right information so that your coders and care teams have access to all of the details for appropriate reimbursement and, and care. So with that, Dr. Newman, I'll pass it back. Okay, great. Thank you, Michael. One, one other comment I think you touched on that I would just emphasize. Um, we keep a library of procedural notes across the entire environment that every user has access to. And so if you come to a case, I think Dr. Lewis mentioned that you know, when you come to a case, he keeps them all as macros. Um, I do much the same. Uh, but if you came to a procedure where you didn't have anything stored for you, you can look at anybody else's notes change 10 words and make it yours forever. So that's another way, once again, that we're uh, uh, working on or improving the workflow, improving your time, and improving your acceptance of uh, how this works. So, uh, Regina, are there some questions out there we need to address? Yes, there are a few. Actually, we're getting quite a few questions about um, EHRs and EHR compatibility. Um, so we had a couple of questions if Nuance is compatible with Athena Healthcare. Uh, yes, yes, we have several Athena customers um, and we are able to send, um, send documents into Athena as well as pull schedules uh, from there as well. So definitely compatible with them, especially in the ASC space as well. The ones that come to mind, um, you know, dozens of uh, HST, we run into HST and I mentioned SIS as well, um, really are, are uh, you know, a company for a lot of the, the EMR bases there as well. And I, and I would just comment and then, that uh, the, the design of this was meant to be agnostic to the parent EMR uh, that we're working with. So we, we're not trying to replace your current system. We're trying to improve uh, the documentation and the information capture and send it back into the resting place. And, uh, and along the same lines, and this is uh, going to be a slightly different answer, would Nuance need to access, access to the EHR system, i.e. EPIC, to use the documentation product? So Dr. Newman, I'll take that. So basically, um, the only thing that the application needs is an ADT feed um, on the front end for all the patient demographic information, and then typically a scheduling message, which 
is again a, a standard ADT message or S, uh, for sending the schedule um, feed. And then on the back end, we send a we can send a PDF or text or in terms of Epic some structured information. In fact, for Epic customers, um, if you are familiar with the Epic app Orchard. Um, Surgical CAPD and our, our uh, partnership with Epic, this is, can be embedded within the Epic window. So for Epic customers, you can actually log into Epic, select your patient the way you would. There's a little Surgical CAPD link that you select there and it, and it takes you to the builder within the Epic window where the, the surgeon doesn't really even know that they, um, that they left uh, the application. So, Again, uh, the Epic App Orchard Nuance Surgical CAPD for that question, you can Google that and, and see a little more information as well. I think we have okay, another is, one. Yeah, go ahead. Oh, Regina, you're doing ahead, great. Molly. I was just gonna see if you needed, <laughs> okay. Go ahead. <laughs> well, we've got a lot of questions that have come in and attendees, please feel free to continue submitting questions in the box on your screen. Uh, as Dr. Newman, Dr. Lewis, and Michael continue to address them. So, um, speakers, one other question that came in is, how does your ASC handle cell phones in the OR from an infection control perspective? Dr. Van Dr. Lewis, you want to tackle that one? Uh, yes. So, um, as, as far as the cell phones go, um, we, we typically do just generalized cleaning. Uh, we don't have any specific bags or anything like that. We put our cell phones in. Uh, in this uh, era of COVID, uh, everything is always doused in some type of sanitizer, uh, be it hands or uh, phones wiped off. And we have not seen any issues with any increase in infection rate in our ASC or our hospital. And I, I'll, I'll comment. Thank you. I'll comment that, you know, I don't use uh, my phone within the sterile field. Um, I use it uh, apart and take images uh, either before or after the prep. Um, and then any photographs that I've taken of the actual case, um, I can reproduce those on my phone. Okay, thank you both. I think this question is probably uh, geared toward Dr. Lewis, so I'll pose it to you, but of course, anyone else who wants to speak to it is, is welcome. Uh, what convinced you to use surgical CAPD, and what advice would you have to persuade surgeons who don't want to try it? Well, I think, uh, first of all, when they, we had the demonstration, the, the, the ease of use that seemed to be involved in, uh, in uh, actually using the system. Uh, also, the, the huge upside we saw, uh, both from an economic standpoint and efficiency standpoint, uh, let me to uh, go in and try the system. The, the biggest thing you got to do in getting the skeptics is to, to, they have to at least try one part of it. I think if they can just get over the hump of, of just trying the system, uh, then they start to see the benefits of it and they begin to use it more and more and more. Um, we, we were a little bit dictatorial in that we, we mandated that all of our surgeons do it. So we got a lot of grumbling but in, in the end, they all came around to using it. So I'll comment that necessity is the mother of invention. And if you look at the process of creating OpNotes just as a, uh, an entity, um, there are a lot of different practices and a lot of different success stories and just as many failures. I mean, I think every hospital and every ASC has lots of uh, uh, examples of surgeons who are notoriously late creating their documentation, forget quality and forget accuracy. And, and so I think, you know, in my opinion, this was uh, a, a, an area that was ripe for change. And so this is just one of the changes uh, in our documentation practices. And granted, um, a, a tremendous number of doctors have been resistant to changing from the old pen and paper. Uh, but obviously we, we've gone there and so I think industry has to continue improving processes, not to disrupt our workflow, but to complement. And when you, when you go to the links to create a better document, um, you know, I think there should be a tangible benefit. And that's what we're trying to show here are, are some of the benefits that you see. But I would agree with Dr. Lewis that initially 
um, you're, you're going to get the same reaction. Doctors don't like change. People don't like change. But often the change that you see uh, is, is worth it. And just when we change from rotary to cell phones, I mean, you know, who would have ever imagined the number of changes in, in industry that have occurred? So anyway, I, I hope you uh, will give this a look. Uh, Regina and Molly, if you have any other thoughts or questions, we'd be happy to answer. Yes, Dr. Newman, one final question is actually for you. Um, and then we'll wrap up here and, and give the speakers uh, a chance for final comments, final thoughts. Uh, before we conclude, but this question is, I have templates in my dictation app and EMR. How is this different? So as we tried to show you, um, we will take whatever templates you have and embed them into this. Uh, the difference is you can actually store multiple versions that are, um, because honestly, every day we do a case, there's slight differences and, you know, we feel like we need to note that. Um, I'm particularly heavy on including uh, specific findings on every single case. And I think Michael touched on the fact that with the red, yellow, green motif that's here, um, we'll show you in the document where where those changes need to occur, where specificity needs to occur in order to create a document that doesn't get queried. And so the reality is, is if you look at templates, there, there's, there's very little elasticity. Um, it's kind of the same unless you choose to strike out and dictate more. I work with Epic at one hospital, Cerner at another, um, and HST at my surgery center. Um, so it's different uh, different templates that you have there, but all of that can be embedded and take advantage of some of the dy dynamic nature of this product. Thank you, Dr. Newman. So, and also thank you, attendees, for your questions. I appreciate those from you. But Dr. Newman, Dr. Lewis, and Michael, let me check in with you for any final thoughts you have as we conclude today's webinar. Dr. Lewis? Go ahead, Lucian. Well, I mean, I, I've already spoken on, on many of the benefits. Once again, I'll say thanks for attending. We, we, we have a, a, a different look and feel. And as Dr. Lewis mentioned, um, you know, it's one of those things, once you look at it and see it, you know, you, you think you just can't do without it. I've had a couple of partners who have left my practice in the last 15 years and wherever they went, they took the tool with them because it becomes rather addictive. Um, you really never want to go back and do traditional dictation without the rules engine because, you know, we're working in an increasingly analytic world and in order to compete, you really have to know what's expected of you. And, and that's what that's what this tool will do. Yeah, and I'll, I'll kind of echo that same thought about how you kind of become dependent on the system. Um, it was just, I think, yesterday I was uh, in, in a rush and wanted to get, do a quick dictation uh, of an H&P, and I realized I'd forgotten what the dictation number is for the hospital because I haven't used it in so long because all of my operative stuff is done through uh, Nuance. Michael? Yeah, I, I would just say that I've spent the last 10 years um, implementing this application and really being a bridge between end users and the development team. And I can say that in every facility you go to, there are definitely the um, physicians that do not want to change, which I totally understand. My father's a 65-year-old uh, cardiothoracic surgeon who it even took me a couple years for him to uh, to want to switch off of dictation. But especially with the dictation piece being in this, it, it really does offer the best of all worlds so that if you're sitting here saying, well, I love that part of the application, but I just, I just don't think I'm going to be able to get Dr. Jones to do this, so therefore I don't want multiple dictation or transcription companies. We're going to stick with what we've got. This is to tell you that you can move forward with Nuance Surgical CAPD and satisfy not only the physicians that have existing templates we can import, um, and work with those so that now they're no longer just static. They really do live and keep up with the time. So they're not really a template. They're what we call custom reports. You then also have Dragon built into it as well. So your physicians that, again, have a 50% template but want to dictate pieces of it every time using their voice but not wait for transcription, the power of Dragon Medical One is built into it. 
And then again, those physicians that want to dictate, we have a state-of-the-art mobile dictation workflow again so that we can accompany for that, but most importantly, wean them off of that process and let them see how by dictating through our application, it's going to learn what you've done so that now you can start to eliminate some of that redundant dictation when you recognize that, again, a lot of what you're dictating is repetitive. So I'll leave it at that as well. And thanks everyone for your time this afternoon. Terrific. Well, this marks the conclusion of the webinar for today. I want to thank Dr. Newman, Dr. Lewis, and Michael for their excellent presentation. And also thank Nuance for sponsoring today's webinar. On behalf of Beckers, we hope you enjoy the rest of your day, and we look forward to having you join us for future webinars. Thank you.